Let's start this video overview at the conclusion and we'll work backward from there. Gabrielle Bubala's Merchants of Dunhuang from Mandu Games is a fantastically well-designed card game for two to four players that does exactly what I think the designer set out to do. Make a rules light game that plays relatively quickly in which players are collecting stocks and bluffing simultaneously while they're being pulled in separate directions both by the actions of other players and their desire to reach one of the two end game goals. The game won't be for everyone, of course, what game is, but if you are looking for something along those lines, let me explain how this works. Here are the components of Merchants of Dunhuang set up and almost ready to play. The game includes a pyramid deck with one one, two twos, three threes, and so on up to 10 tens. And you adjust the size of the deck and the numbers included based on the player count. But in my pretend four player game, you use all of the cards. You have eight double-sided action tiles. You flip those tiles around and shuffle them however you wish, lay them out in a ring of eight, and then place a card at random from the top of the deck next to each action tile. Each player is dealt a hand of three cards. They look at those cards and they keep only one of them, removing the other two cards from the game. So you have some mystery as to which cards are actually in play. You have a number of coins based on the player count and you're set to begin. What drives most of the action in Merchants of Dunhuang are two game ending conditions, one of which is an instant win condition. If you achieve that, done. You just run around the table and triumph and probably play again because the game is short. If no one achieves that instant win condition, then when the central deck runs out, you complete the round so that everyone has the same number of turns and then you're going to score points. And the tension between those two victory conditions, achieving the instant win or having the most points, can pull you in different directions as the game progresses. To complete setup, the player to the right of the start player places the camel on any card around the table. On a turn, you're going to first move the camel one or more spaces, with the first move being free and each additional space after that costing you one coin. So this costs one, two coins, three coins, four coins, etc. So if I stop here, I pay one coin. I then take the card that I land on and I either add it to my hand or I place it in front of me. And if I now have as many cards of this type or more compared to each other player, I take the majority token. So if someone else had a six already, I would steal this token from them. If someone else gets a six now, they will take it from me. After you resolve the card, you either take the action on the tile or you take three coins from the bank and add them to your hand. In this case, I can look at the number of majority tokens I have and score a prestige token for each of them. These are worth one point, but they matter only if we have the actual end game scoring where we get through the deck and we are concerned about points. If someone has an instant win, these are irrelevant. After I carry out the action or take the coins, I see whether I meet the instant win condition, which is having four different numbered cards in my hand and four majority tokens, which obviously at the beginning of the game, I am far from that. In a two player game, you need four different cards and five tokens. You adjust the card count. So in a three player game, you don't use the one in 10. In a two player game, you also don't use the nine. So you'll have only seven tokens total and you need five of those tokens in addition to four cards in hand, four different cards in hand. The other actions available. Ah, oh, let's end my turn by turning over a card, adding it here. So the next player goes, and that's how each turn proceeds. Move the camel, take a card in your hand or your collection, take the power or not, and continue. If someone hits the instant win condition, done, they win. Otherwise, you're going to score points at the end of the game. Now, some of the other actions available to you, well, in this case, you can take a card from your display and add it to your hand or go vice versa, from your hand to the display. Here, direct the player to give you two cards from their hand, you add them to your hand, then you give them two cards back and you get a prestige token. Here, you see the camel lands. I can take any card on display here and swap it with a card in my personal display. If I got rid of my six, well now I don't have majority in sixes, so I'd have to hand this back in. In the early game, some of these powers don't do much, but as you start adding more cards to your collection and to your hand, they become much more important. In this case, 
I discard a card from my hand from the game, and I score three prestige tokens. In this one, I flip over a majority token, and now if someone ties me, instead of stealing the token, I just flip it back. So that gives me another round to hold on to it, either for this action or for the instant win. Each action tile is double-sided, and the action on the other side is related to the power on the first side although there is no first side because these are put up randomly. So in this case, you flip the tile over to its protected side. However, someone who would tie you can pay you two coins and now they will take this. Okay, so that's similar to the first one. Here you can discard a card from your display instead of your hand and you get three prestige tokens. Here, the, you grab two cards at random from another player so they can't give you their junk or the things they don't want you add them to your hand and then you give them two cards of your choice. So everything is kind of related to one another. Here, you are going to count how many spaces you move the camel. So if I go from here, one, two, three, four, I would draw four cards, add one of them of my choice to my hand and then put the other ones on the bottom. On the other side, I'm just drawing two cards, keeping one, putting the other on the bottom. So everything is related it's a lot to take in at first, but the powers are very straightforward, and after one game, usually you're all set. You start with a single card, which seems like almost nothing, and the initial turns seem fairly irrelevant, because sure, I get a card in front of me, I have the majority, and then it's just stolen away by someone else a turn later. But the turns are very quick, and you are soon at the point where someone has multiple majorities, and you are worried about them hitting the instant win condition. They've got three majorities. What cards are on the table? How many coins do they have? What can they put down? Oh wait, they have only two cards in hand. They definitely can't have four different numbers. I don't have to worry about that yet but at some point it becomes a threat. Or this person has six cards in their hand, what actions are available to them so they can drop cards and possibly gain majorities immediately based on what they play? What's available to people? You quickly hit this point where everyone seems like they're on the verge of winning and you have to be stealing things and watching out and seeing what flips and the pyramid nature of the deck becomes very important. How many threes have we seen? How many fours? How many fives? You want to keep track of such things, although of course some cards were removed at the beginning of play. You saw two of those cards that were removed, but you don't know what else left the game. What other majorities are available that people can take? How definite are the majorities that you have? Now, if you don't hit the instant win condition, you play through the deck, everyone has the same number of turns, and then you score. And when you score, any majority token you have is worth two points. All the prestige tokens are one point each. Coins are irrelevant, except as a tiebreaker. But the real points come from the cards in your hand. For each number in your hand, you are going to see who has as many or more than you. So I've got two sevens. If someone else has three or more sevens, then I just throw these away. But if someone only has two or more, then I'm going to keep one of these and that's worth seven points to me. If I have two tens and no one else has more than two, I keep this as well. Here, I've got 17 points. The majority tokens and the prestige tokens now seem like nothing compared to the points that you can get for what's in your hand. So you've got this tension where some people seem like they wanna just start hoarding for the end game. They don't think someone's going to win. But the more that someone hoards, the less they're competing for the majorities in play, and the more likely it is that someone else is going to have an instant win. I played eight times with two, three, and four players on a review copy from Mandu Games, and see this tension continually. It is brilliant how it works with one player sort of shutting themselves out and then that allows other people to move in for the majority instant win. Because it doesn't matter if I'm collecting for points, I just need four different cards in my hand. Doesn't matter what they are. If I get the instant win, doesn't matter if I was going to lose that or not. But if someone hoards, then they're often not competing for the majorities and then the other players find it easier to get them, or they're less likely to be stolen. And so you get this great tension between people, 
you know, it's, it, to some degree, it's that stopping the next person down the line. What do I need to do to hurt them, but ideally help me at the same time? And in long games, that can be an issue where I don't want to have to take actions to necessarily hurt the person who's going to win. But this game often plays out in 15 to 20 minutes. And for that time frame, this is a perfect dynamic where everyone's sort of responsible for what comes next. But at the same time, you are putting the knife to someone else by the cards you collect and threatening to win or working towards majority. And this has worked in both the two and the three and the four player game where you just have more cards in play with four players. So there's more majority tokens to fight over. But again, as people hoard things, some stuff just goes away. You have the one, which is great because no one can take that from you if you put that on the table as a majority token. With the two, well, maybe you threw out a two and now you've got the one there that's, that's locked in. You could keep the two in your hand, but again, that's worth only two points. Whereas on the table, it's now threatening or helping you win without someone being able to take that away, unlike the seven, eight, nine, tens. So it's a great tension that plays out very quickly. And the first game takes a little bit because you're confronted with the eight icons. You have no idea what's good. You don't know the flow of the game. You just do stuff at random. And then immediately we finish and we're just like, we got to play this again. I mean, you take the action tiles, you shuffle them all up, lay them out again and start over. They're very straightforward once you get that first game out of the way and you see now how things work and the arc of the game as people build things over time and you start having to worry about who's doing what when, who's on the edge of winning. Oh, I see you've picked up three nines already. I know that you're sort of just stepping out possibly. You're worrying about that end game scoring. Can I make it so that those nines don't matter? Or I can use powers to possibly take cards from you or flip things around or do something so that ideally I can at least tie you. There's lots of great simple things going on in this very small design. Maybe you'll get a chance to play it sometime. Merchants of Dunhuang by Gabriel Bubala. Awesome job.